Okay, everyone, welcome. Uh, we're thrilled to welcome you to the second installment of the Hoover Texas Data Series. Uh, the goal of this workshop is to have researchers from across academic disciplines present some of their latest work using Texas data to study a variety of social problems. Today, we're more than thrilled to have the actual co-coordinator co for this workshop, Steve Davis, present. He's the William H. Abbott Distinguished Service Professor of International Business and Economics at the University of Chicago and a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution. Uh, during the talk, if you have questions, please ask them in the Q&A, which you'll see at the, at the bottom of the, the Zoom function here. If the questions are clarifying, I'll interrupt Steve, ask him to, to clarify. Otherwise, we're gonna defer those questions to the end of the talk. After the talk is over, if you wanna stick around, we're gonna have a more informal discussion about the methods that went into the talk and the sort of nuts and bolts about how this research came to be. Uh, so without further ado, Steve, take it away. Thank you, Justin. Um, it's, uh, it's great to be here. Um, I'm going to talk about some research with uh, Marco Salmon, Scott Baker, and Nick Bloom. And uh, we're excited about this and uh, really thrilled to have the opportunity to uh, talk about it. So let me try to share my screen. So we're going to look at what triggers stock market jumps, what drives them in approximate sense. Um, and I want to start with an example. So the US stock market rose uh, almost 5% on the 26th of December uh, 2018. That's from the close of the previous day to the close of the, of the 26th. That's a huge one day jump. It's unclear why, why the market rose that day. At least it was unclear to contemporaneous observers. So as an indication of that, let me show you a newspaper article, next day newspaper article about it. Um, and I'll zero in on this third paragraph, which has got the key passages uh, for my purposes. So zoom into that. And this is just a direct quotation. And I wanna draw your attention to the part where the journalist basically says, nobody knew why the market rose 5%. Investors and traders were left scratching their heads to explain the wild swing. That's rather interesting. You have this enormous move in the market and at least uh, in near real time, nobody seems to know why. Now there are many other jumps, perhaps most of them in which it's uh, reasonably evident, sometimes crystal clear, what, what triggered a big market move. Okay, and so I've got two examples of that at the top of this slide. One is on the 18th of April, 2001. Um, the market rose 3.9% on that day, but you can see that the bulk of the move occurred within the space of about 10 minutes in the immediate wake of the Fed announcing a surprise rate cut. So you, in an event like that, the journalist sees what's happening in real time, writes an article about it and says it was because the Fed cut the interest rate and people were surprised by it. We would read that the next, we'd read that and we'd classify that as a jump that was triggered by monetary policy. Then on the right, on the right top chart, there's another example. 2nd of July, 2009, the market fell almost 3% at open. And this was shortly after a negative uh, employment situation report. So a surprisingly bad uh, employment situation report from the BLS. And this is uh, one of the best macroeconomic, best known macroeconomic statistical sources that often moves markets. In the lower right, that's the day, that's the uh, intraday moves. These are minute by minute uh, data points, by the way. That's the intraday move on the uh, day that I started with, okay? The 5% uh, jump due to unknown reasons. Um, and the other one on the le lower left is another case where uh, it wasn't clear why the market did what it did. <clears throat> so, you can see, I think, already in these two examples, um, some interesting questions and the germ of a research idea. Two questions are, what, what drives the stock market moves, these big moves, at least in approximate sense? And second, you know, can we go about getting a quantitative handle on the perceived clarity of why the market does what it does? You can see I have some clarity values there. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how we construct those. And those are measured in standard deviation units. So a value of 1.6 is by our metric, a, cl a crystal clear 
uh, in terms of uh, why, according to the journalist, the market did what it did, and a negative value is a you know is a is a less 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 clear than average. And this minus one point two value at the lower left that's a really unclear um, unclear jump uh, cause or reason. And I'll talk about how we quantify those. So we're going to get those. The, the germ of the research idea is also in these examples, um, and that is to um, examine uh, the accounts of large daily market moves uh, in next day newspaper accounts or same evening accounts in the internet era uh, when stories get posted uh, online the evening before they're published in print. So we're going to take that idea and we're going to deploy it at scale. Okay, and that's basically the 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 research approach here. So this is going to be a very low tech. We're going to deploy it at scale with human readings, by the way. So there's going to be a low tech use of um, of text data, but one I think has is quite promising um, in many contexts, as I'll try to make clear. So to put it more plainly, the approach is we're going to have trained human beings read and code next day newspaper accounts of large daily jumps in national stock markets. The human will read it, try to digest what the uh, main content of it is and then code it according to a training guide and reference manual that, that we've developed. So here's an overview of the process. We set a daily jump threshold for each country in our sample. For the United States, the threshold is 2.5%. Okay, so if the market moves up or down by more than that amount, we say that's a daily jump, it gets into our data set. That picks up about three and a half percent of all US trading days since 1900, which is the start of our analysis, and about half of all squared daily variation. Once we get those jumps, then we go look in leading newspapers for next day articles about the jump. And for jumps of this magnitude, you typically find at least one article. Once we find that article, our human readers will read the article to identify the primary reason for the jump according to the article. So we're trying to, we're trying to codify what the journalist claims happened and why. Then we'll classify that into one of 17 categories. And in line with the very first example I showed you, one category will be essentially nobody knows. Okay, so that's a category. We'll, we'll also classify the secondary reason for the jump if one is offered. We'll quantify journalist confidence as to the primary reason for the jump on a three-point scale. We'll quantify the ease of coding for the reader, which is meant to capture the ease or difficulty of both discerning the journalist explanation and putting it into one of our 17 categories. The other main piece of information we'll record is the geographic origin of the market moving news, again, according to the journalist. That could be a country, multiple country, or regions, region of the world. Now, why newspaper accounts of daily jumps? First, newspapers are ubiquitous, and digital archives are easy to access. Second, major papers operate on a daily cycle, which is why we focus here on daily jumps. Um, and as I mentioned before, they typically contain articles about jumps of the size we consider. We also think newspapers are particularly meaningful in that they both reflect and inform perceptions of what happened and why. Uh, this approach is also scalable, and this has to do with, again, the ubiquity of newspapers. We will examine, with these human readings, more than 6,000 stock market jumps across 16 national markets to assess their proximate cause, as I explained before, the clarity as to the cause and the geographic source of the market moving news. And we're expanding this to other countries as we go along, and we've done some on other financial markets as well. Given this audience, I suspect a lot of people are asking why human readers? This seems like a very laborious process. Um, so a few answers, a few responses to that. First, you can see the codings as generating data that could be used to train automated classification algorithms. And we've done some of that. If I have time, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, but even so, I want you to recognize that automated algorithms face um, some significant challenges in this setting. First, for 
for some categories, for some jump categories that might be of considerable interest, there's just not that many observations in the sample. So it's not even clear that you could generate a large enough data set to, to train some algorithm. Second, there are subtle distinctions that would be challenging to capture with an algorithm. So for the economists in the crowd, um, there's the Taylor rule concept and named after John Taylor, the, uh, the uh, developer in, uh, of this concept in which you want to distinguish between monetary policy reactions to news about the macroeconomy and monetary policy surprises that are, that are caused by a, an unanticipated monetary policy move. So that's a, that's a distinction that humans can make uh, much more readily uh, than can an automated algorithm. There, and there are also challenges in understanding context uh, that you might think humans are better able to do than automated algorithms, especially when you have to remember we've, we've got a limited number of uh, observations to work with in many cases. And then another interesting thing that comes out um, that, that presents a challenge for algorithms is as you go farther back in time or as you look at events that are harder to explain, um, the language that journalists use becomes more convoluted. Uh, and it's kind of an interesting tendency to hedge and hem and so on that shows up even in, uh, in the writings by professional journalists and in our experience, the automated classification algorithms have a harder time of just parsing what people are saying when they're doing all this hedging and qualification. Let me give you a preview of key findings. First, um, the one I, what I wanna to stress today is policy-driven stock market jumps are highly distinctive. Um, by that, I mean jumps that are attributed to some policy news as opposed to say news about the macroeconomic outlook or news about corporate earnings or interest rates or something like that. They're distinctive in the following senses. The policy-driven jumps drive a considerably higher share of upward jumps than downward jumps. That's true in all the countries we look at. In addition, the policy share of upward jumps, positive, uh, positive jumps, is inversely related to stock market performance in the preceding three months. In other words, there's a counter cyclicality to the surprise nature of policy uh, driven jumps, okay? Um, both of these patterns have strengthened over time uh, in the United States and in the United Kingdom, the two countries for which we have uh, you know, roughly a century or more of data. Second key point is that the, the type of the jump as we classify it matters for future volatility. And in particular, the most striking result there is jumps that journalists attribute to monetary policy foreshadow much lower future volatility in the market than other jumps. And that's true unconditionally and conditional, conditional on a battery of kind of standard controls for um, autocorrelation of volatility in, in financial markets. Clarity as to the reason for the jump also matters. Greater clarity about why the market jumped foreshadows lower volatility in the future, in the, in the next uh, few weeks. It's all, and I'm gonna make another observation in, the, in this context. As we measure clarity, it's trended upwards substantially over the last 90 years in the US and the UK. And the last key point I wanna develop in today's talk is that when you look outside the United States, other countries looking at their own newspapers, their own leading newspapers, attribute about a third of the jumps in their own national markets to US related news. That's a, the US plays an extraordinary role in global equity markets. That's completely unlike the role played by Europe. Okay, there's nothing like that for Europe, even though Europe as a whole accounts for a larger share of the global economy. And until the last decade, really, there's no role like that for China. Although you do see an increasing role for China in explaining uh, third jumps in third party countries in the last decade. So a few more work, words about the methodology. The coding guide, um, the part of the coding guide that des describes how an article should be digested and classified includes definitions, a bunch of examples, hard, hard cases, and so on. 
So here is the coding guide definition for international trade policy. I'll just read it to you. So this is literally the concept we're trying to get. News reports, forecasts, or concerns that pertain to international trade and commercial policies, including tariffs, import quotas, voluntary export restraints, trade agreements, trade subsidies, and WTO cases. We have a definition like that for all 17 categories, as well as examples for each category of how to do this in practice. Here's an article um, in which it's headline US stocks sell off on concerns about trade. The market fell two and a half percent on this day. Um, if you read the article, this is one we would code as the primary category being trade policy and the second category being macro news and outlook. I won't go through the details, but basically this article emphasizes the role of the trade policy news and gives secondary weight to news about the macro outlook. Here's another example, one which uh, many of you were familiar with. This is back in the peak of the global financial crisis when uh, uh, Bernanke and Paulson came to Congress with uh, a proposed uh, fiscal stimulus bailout plan, TARP-1 as it's sometimes referred to, that was rejected by Congress. And the market fell you know, nearly 9% in reaction to that. So this is something we would classify as government spending even though it's news about something that did not happen, the news is about uh, government spending. So with that background, here's the categorical distribution of roughly 1,100 jumps that we have classified uh, in the manner I described in the United States from 1900 to 2020. And I've divided it up into basically uh, uh, since World War II, and then and, and World War II and before. The biggest category you can see is macroeconomic news and outlook. That's not surprising perhaps. Uh, the biggest category, uh, in the, the biggest monetary policy category in the post-war period is, I say that wrong, the biggest policy category in the post-war period is monetary policy. Um, the biggest policy category in the, uh, in the first 45 years of the 20th century encompassing World War I and II was, was sovereign military actions. Now, there's a lot of effort in the paper devoted to validating this methodology. And I'm just gonna give you a, talk about one, 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 va one validation exercise we did or set of exercises uh, and not drill into the, into the others. But you might have some concerns. Um, you might have many concerns, but I've listed two of them at the top of this slide. And that is that newspapers can differ in how they interpret or explain a given jump. And second, human beings, even when they read an article about a given jump from a given newspaper, they might interpret it differently and classify the uh, jump event differently, okay? So to address these concerns, what we do is we have many humans read. We have many news, we have multiple newspapers, at least for the United States, we have up to seven newspapers and we have multiple readers per article per newspaper. So that allows us to calculate agreement rates across people within a newspaper for a given jump and across newspapers and, and readers. So I'll show you what, what those agreement rates look like, but later on, I'm gonna take these concerns about the inputs and actually use it as part of uh, an in constructing our clarity measure. This chart shows you the, the dot size here is the number is proportional, the number of jumps in the indicated year um, and on the left vertical scale, you see the average number of human readings per jump that we have. So it ranges from eight to 14. And the right scale shows you the number of newspapers we're reading on average by year. And that, that's in the four to five range. So we have many readings per newspaper per jump. And that allows us to calculate these cross coder and cross newspaper agreement rates. Uh, so let me just drill in. So this is about 10,500 human readings or codings of 1,100 jumps. And if I look at the um, agreement rate, uh, just between policy and non-policy in the first half, uh, first 45 years of our sample, it's 75%. It's a little bit higher in the second half of the sample. Um, if I look all, if I go within granular categories, so these 17 categories, and look at the Wall Street Journal, which is definitely the most kind of professionally written set of articles over this whole time period, we get a 77% agreement rate across readers um, in the first 
in the first period and 80% uh, across readers um, in the second period. This is across reader, you know, just within the Wall Street Journal. And you can compare that to what you would get um, if these classifications were just completely random. You can generate that from the unconditional distribution of the classifications. And you can see that there's, these agreement rates are not 100%, um, but they're much, much greater than uh, what you would get from random assignment. So we interpret that to say that there's some signal coming through the noise here. Now, there's many other types of validation. I'm not going to have time to go through them, although um, they may come up in some of the Q&A. The, the one I want to draw your attention to, though, that I will do is kind of the proof in the pudding uh, approach. And that is, I'll show you that our newspaper-based classifications yield information that helps predict future stock market volatility. Uh, and that's, that's what I mean by proof in the pudding. Okay, and here's a broad description of what the data look like from 1900 to 2020. And what you see on this chart is above zero, we have the number of upward jumps in the year. Below zero, we have the number of downward jumps in the year. You can see market volatility measured this way varies enormously over time. The 1930s was the most volatile period, not surprising. Global financial crisis uh, was the second. COVID was, um, was also an extremely volatile period. Lots of jumps in 2020 uh, from March, Mar especially in the March to May period. And then I'm just showing you kind of the policy, non-policy versus unknown breakdown in this, in this uh, chart. Now, on to the first of the key findings that I talked about. Policy news triggers a larger share of upward jumps than downward jumps. And th these, I'm showing you here US data, um, and I've broken it up into the first eight, eight decades and then uh, the period from 1980 onward. <clears throat> there are two main points I want you to take away from this chart. The first is you simply see there's a considerably greater propensity for policy-driven news driven jumps to be in the upward direction than in the downward direction. The second thing I want you to see is that's more true in recent decades. This is not at all true for non-policy jumps. In fact, if anything, there, it goes slightly the other direction. So there's a distinctive aspect of policy-driven jumps. This policy tilt, this positive tilt of policy-driven jumps holds across all the countries in our sample. Okay, so it's not just a US-specific phenomenon. This picture that I showed you here, you get a very similar pattern if you look at the United Kingdom. In other words, similar pattern in each subperiod, but the relationship gets stronger in recent decades. So that's the first finding I want to leave you with. Second finding is policy news is more likely to come along and trigger a positive jump when the stock market's been falling in the previous three months. That might seem surprising in one sense, but it suggests some capacity of, and this is mainly monetary policy and fiscal policy that underlies this picture, not the other policy categories. Some capacity of uh, policymakers to actually engineer what at least is perceived to be surprise positive movements uh, in the market, okay? Um, maybe we'll get into a discussion of how that can come about, but it's a it's a strong feature in the data. Again, it shows up um, in the UK data and the US data, and it gets stronger over time in both countries. In other words, policy-driven jumps have become more counter-cyclical in, in the sense that I just described in the previous period in recent decades. That's basically the mes message of this table. I think I'll just say it in words uh, rather than try to walk you through um, the entries. But, and, and this pattern, it's mainly coming from uh, monetary policy and fiscal policy. And you see that same pattern in those categories individually. So even though it's, um, we've got other jumps in most other categories, there's a small enough number that it's hard to say something precise about that policy category in and of itself. But if you look at, if you kind of look at things in a more aggregated perspective, this story about the counter cyclicality of policy driven jumps is mainly about monetary policy and fiscal policy. Now, here's the proof in the pudding stuff. Jump type has predictive power for post jump volatility. The most striking result in that respect 
is the distinction between jumps, which according to next day newspaper accounts were triggered by monetary policy and other jumps, okay? So what I'm showing you here is days after the jump, um, the difference between um, uh, standard measure of um, uh, you know, sum of squared daily, <laughs> So the uh, standard measure of realized volatility in the market, just the uh, sum of the squared uh, uh, return, uh, sum of the squared returns um, over time. And we go out to about 20 days. You can see here that the, mo the monetary policy curve is way below the other curve. And uh, until we get out here to the right sort of the right side of the sample, you know, they're not even overlapping uh, at the uh, two, uh, the don't even have overlapping at the 95% confidence intervals. Now this picture uh, I have conditioned on um, kind of standard controls for, for volatility. So I'm conditioning on um, volatility, realized volatility over the previous day, the previous week, and the previous month. I'm also conditioning on whether the jump was to the upside or to the downside. Uh, the magnitude here is pretty big. It's about one standard deviation. Um, of, um, of realized volatility. So this is a big effect. In fact, it's so the monetary policy effect is so big that your forward-looking view of volatility after a monetary policy jump is about the same as your forward-looking view of volatility after no jump, okay? Uh, <clears throat> so that's a big effect and, and gets to this, this um, predictive content of the classifications that, that we've constructed here. By the way, one more thing I should mention, monetary policy jumps are about 10% of all jumps in the United States and in most of the other countries in our sample. Now, let's try to move beyond the categories and quantify this clarity concept that I started out uh, with in my very first example. And I'm gonna do that in multiple ways. First, one, one indicator of clarity is whether the journalist says nobody knows. If, they're, if he talks about, you know, they're just scratching their head trying to figure out what happened, that seems like a pretty good indication that it's an un, that the reason for the jump is unclear. So that's the share unknown you see in the lower right of this, of this uh, picture. And you can see that that's trended down rather substantially over the course of our sample. It's well above 20% in the early decades, and it's more like 10% um, since, uh, since World War II. Another obvious thing to look at is the confidence with which the journalist asserts an explanation, okay? And that's trended up. Um, two other things we look at are the pairwise agreement rates across these codings or reads that I talked about earlier. You might think that um, when it's less clear why the market moved the way it did, journalists would tend to use more convoluted language and it would be harder for our readers to discern what they're trying to say and to come up with a common understanding of what's in the article. Well, you see that as well. And then finally, there's just a related concept, which is how much trouble did the journalist have in figuring out, not the journalist, how much trouble did our human reader have in figuring out what the journalist was trying to say and classifying that. And that's our ease of coding measure. So these are four distinct kind of uh, independently constructed measures they all have a similar trend. We're going to construct a clarity index by standardizing each of those to have mean zero unit standard deviation and then just add them up. Okay, this is what comes out of that. And I'm measuring here this clarity index, which is what I'll use going forward um, on uh, standard deviation scale. So you can see that the, the overall clarity is risen by more than a standard deviation on average, the average clarity judging by the, uh, the, the smooth regression fit here. So that's, that's, I'll take from that that the perceived clarity about what's happening in the stock market has improved over time. Um, we have lots of thoughts about and some evidence about what's driving that. Maybe we can get to that in the Q&A. But let me just show you a few more facts. Um, volatility uh, around low clarity days tends to be high, both before and after and um, volatility tends to be lower. 
uh, before and after high clarity days. That's true in the post-war period. It's true in the full sample. Maybe not surprising, but, but uh, good to know. Greater clarity also foreshadows less post, uh, lower post-jump volatility. And again, that's conditional on kind of standard horror controls for volatility over the past day, week, and month, and, um, and the uh, direction of the jump change. This effect's also pretty big. It's not quite as statistically significant as the monetary policy effect, but basically the difference here between these high, so this is the, the low clarity and high clarity jumps, just splitting the sample in the middle, it's about 1.3 standard deviations on the, on the volatility metric. So this is a pretty, at five days out, that's a pretty big difference. Policy, these two, these two predictive things I've talked to you about before are not completely independent because policy jumps tend to be of higher clarity. That is especially true for jumps due to monetary policy and jumps attributed to sovereign military actions and, and, and policy, okay? The black here is the overall, is the uh, non-policy. And you can see that's got a much more left skewed distribution on the clarity scale than the sovereign military jumps. That's true to a somewhat lesser extent for monetary policy. It's also true for government spending. It's not, so, not, it's not as true for the other policy categories. Now, I wanna talk a little bit about the um, international results. Here's our current global sample. We've got 16 national markets, including two for China. We've got Shanghai market and uh, Hong Kong market. Okay, they're both big markets, um, and we'll 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 treat we'll treat each of them uh, separately. Here's the period we cover. For most other countries, other than the UK and the US, we start in 1980 or later. Here are our main sources, our main newspaper sources. This is the jump threshold we use for these other countries. We choose the jump threshold so that we get, we pick out over a, over a period of decades, roughly 3% of the days, of the trading days um, for that country. I showed you a picture like this for the United States earlier. Here it is for the United Kingdom. It actually, it actually, you might not remember the earlier picture that well because I showed it to you quickly. It looks quite, it looks fairly different. The global financial crisis shows up um, in a big way for both countries, but the 1930s is a much milder event in the United Kingdom than in the United States, and that's already well known. That shows up in our metric as well. On the other hand, the 1970s not a not a great time in the United States, but it was a you know, really really stressful crisis-ridden period in the UK, and that shows up very clearly uh, in our metric. Here's the single most important thing I have to say to you on the international side of things. What I've got here is in the black, indicates Europe, and all Europe, Europe as a whole, meaning, meaning um, events attributed to a particular European country, pan-European institutions like the ECB or the EU um, or a collection of European countries. Uh, and then I've got the United States is captured by these, uh, these red dots. Um, I've also shown you that Europe's share of global output at PPP adjusted prices and the US share of global output at PPP adjusted prices. Um, and you can see Europe's got a bigger share of global output by this, me by this measure, by by quite some distance. The set of countries I'm looking at in this picture is all the countries in our sample, excluding European countries and the United States. That leaves me with 10 countries. And what you see in these 10 countries is they attribute a remarkably large share of uh, their, their own newspapers. We're always going to own country newspapers. Their own country newspapers attribute about 35% of the jumps in their country, country's stock market, to developments in the United States or related to the United States, okay, related to U.S. policy, for example. Uh, in Europe, there's, it's basically, with the with the big exception of the European sovereign debt crises, there's almost no impact um, of Europe-related news 
caught triggering, according to our analysis, uh, jumps in non-European countries. The US, this picture of these red dots, by the way, looks very similar if I put European countries into the picture. So if I had 15, 15 national markets rather than just 10 non-European markets. So there's an enormous role, according to our analysis, um, of US related news developments, news and policy developments on equity markets around the globe. And as many of you will know that there's a large literature in monetary policy, central banking, international finance, open economy macro setting that finds that the United States and the dollar and the Fed, the central bank, are also play an outsized role uh, in the global economy. So what we're seeing here is that, that that's also true in equity markets. Now, this is just a similar picture, but now we're just looking at the United States and we're asking what's the geographic origin according to US newspapers of movements in the US stock market. Uh, and again, here we go all the way back to 1900. We can see, well, Europe, news coming out of Europe and related to Europe is a big deal during World War I and World War II. But in the post-war period with the main exception being the sovereign debt crisis, European news doesn't often move uh, US markets uh, in a big way. Um, here's the comparison of the United States and China. And basically, and I don't think you'll be surprised by this, but China's China related developments have almost no impact on third party country stock markets until the mid 2000s. And in the last decade or so, China's had quite a big impact, not quite as large as the United States, but definitely bigger than any other region uh, of the world. Okay, so let me summarize. Policy driven jumps are distinctive. They're highly distinctive in the ways that I talked about. Upward ones are more common than downward ones. There's this interesting counter cyclicality of the surprise aspects of policy news that drives the jumps. Both those patterns have strengthened over time. Second point I, I, I want to leave you with is volatility rises much less after jumps triggered by monetary policy than after other jumps. That suggests that monetary policy. When monetary policy moves the market, it tends to resolve uncertainty, whereas other types of jumps tend to accentuate uncertainty. That's a very interesting distinction that is suggested by our, our analysis. Clarity also matters. Higher, higher volatility after low clarity jumps. There's po I didn't have time to tell you about it, but there's positive autocorrelation in jump clarity itself. Uh, clarity has risen a lot uh, over time. And finally, there's this exceptional role for the, for the uh, United States in equity markets around the world. Our, we have a website, stockmarketjumps.com, uh, devoted to this research project. Uh, you can find our data there. I think all the Wall Street Journal codings are already online. Uh, we'll be adding um, other, country, other, other, um, other countries and, and uh, other newspapers as we go along. We update this in near real time. So if you want to see our classification of the latest big moves in the stock market, just check out the website the next day. I will stop there and open things up for questions, comments, and criticisms. Thank you, Steve. That was uh, outstanding. I, I personally have a whole series of questions. We do have one in the, in the chat. Uh, and it's a question I had as well. So I'm going to sort of paraphrase the question and sort of add in some of my own. The question comes, comes from Stephen Hansen. And it's broadly about how to think about language evolution. So one of the things I've noticed in doing this sort of work is that you ask a team of coders to go back 100 years, 200 years, the English language just looks less familiar to them. And as Stephen points out in his question, now I'm reading what he's saying, he says, I think I've seen evidence that English has become more direct and less convoluted in general over the last 100 years. And so he's wondering to what extent are some of the patterns arising from clarity in the English language and the way it's it's being articulated, I would add on to that and wonder yeah. to what extent is additional clarity coming from asking coders to read language they're more familiar with, linguistic patterns that they can interpret more easily compared to language 100 years ago? Yeah, gr great set of questions. And, it's, um, and those questions are great for this particular paper or for any long sweep historical analysis that tries to use language. So they're really kind of fundamental questions. So a few things. Um, we, we, 
what we see, and, and by we now, I'm going to draw also my own personal, I've read hundreds of these things in the last several years. So I'm going to, there's, there's things I know, I feel like I know that are hard to put on the, quantify on the page. But it's definitely, we see in newspapers, um, there's a tendency over time towards less convoluted language. And that may be what Stephen Hansen was referring to. But in addition, there's a tendency to use more direct, less convoluted language at any point in time in the newspapers that are kind of more professional. So if you go, if you look in the 1960s at the Wall Street Journal, you're gonna find better, more direct language, easier things to understand uh, in the Wall Street Journal than in most major regional newspapers, for example, or even the New York Times. That was reflected in those agreement rates that I showed you earlier. We get higher agreement rates across people for the Wall Street Journal than any other newspaper. And I think that's because they're written in more direct, uh, direct prose. They're just, they're, they may part, be partly a professionalization of the reporters, but also um, the editing process. And it's the focus of the, of the newspaper. So you would expect it to do a better job. Um, <clears throat> now to your comment about the familiarity of the, um, of the coders. So let me, this gets into a bit of the language that's being used and the context. So let this gets a bit into the weeds and let me tell you how we handle that. The, the guidance we tell the coders is, we want you to put yourself in the shoes of a reasonably informed reader of that newspaper in real time. So if they're referring to some event that you don't know about, but they're kind of taking for granted, that the reader knows about it, go look it up, figure out what that event is. So that's kind of the context. What we don't want the readers to do, and we're very clear about this, don't try to go figure out, don't, don't look at some other explanation for what happened. Your, your job is to discern what the journalist was trying to say at, at the time. So that's, that's kind of the guidance we give the readers. The, now, we also meet with these readers, and I think this is very important. We meet with them regularly, and we've operated in two main modes, kind of the academic year mode, where we get a team of typically undergrad econ majors, and they go off and work eight hours a week on this and meet with us once a week, where we, among other things, allow them to bring hard cases or hard calls to the group meeting. And that allows us to draw on our, hopefully, much greater domain expertise and historical knowledge to fill in some of these gaps. The other mode we operate in is kind of the summer mode where we get teams of, of people and they work intensively like for two, three weeks and we meet with them every day. So there's, we can get more, we can get into this more uh, if people want, there's a lot. I've skipped over the nuts and bolts of how to do this. And I've now done um, two of these multi-year rather large scale structured human readings exercises in which I've learned a lot about how to do them and how to design them and a number of smaller ones. So there's definitely an art, there's definitely an art to doing this right. And because the process is so labor intensive, it's not like you just, oh, I didn't, I didn't run my regression right. Let me just go run it again. You really want to think carefully about how you design this and execute it before you've spent three years and you say, oh, you know, I, I should have done it this way instead of that way. So we, we can get into that for those who are interested. I'll save that at the end, I think, because that's probably a narrower subset of people who, who are interested in that aspect of it. Yeah, that was actually going to make the same proposal that I have a bunch of follow-up questions, but let's defer that to the nuts and bolts discussion. Because in the chat, we've gotten a, a, a number of sort of more economics focused questions. So uh, David Gibbons asks, if you could discuss the effect of man-made versus natural disasters uh, in your sort of cause and effect. So how does that relate to policy jumps? Well, we have both. Um, we have sovereign military uh, and security actions, which is you know often where some of the man-made disasters get classified. Um, we also have uh, a separate category. You may not have noticed this for kind of non-sovereign, non violent actions by non-state actors. These are terrorism events would come in there. Um, and then pandemics, you know, the pandemic is, is something that we classified um, as other non-policy. And then um, 
And then at least if the journalist says the market tanked because of concerns about COVID, um, then we classify that as other non-policy. We would and then our our coders are supposed to then write well specifically what was it about. So this is one of the design features. We can then roll other COVID into a COVID into macroeconomic outlooks if you prefer uh, for some purposes. So we've got um, we've got the uh, lots of ability to speak to this issue. And let me just give you one example. We've really only drilled down deeply in one place. You're still seeing my slides. So this is from a different paper, but it builds on the one I talked about. Um, it turns out that there's nothing, there's nothing even remotely comparable to the impact of the coronavirus on the US or Chinese stock markets in previous pandemic episodes. Okay, and so I'll make the point with respect to the US stock market. This is just a very coarse tabulation of some of the data that we looked at in different ways. So the, the top row here is um, all of the jumps in our data set from 1900 to 21 February, 2020. There's more than 1100. How many did next day journalist accounts attribute to uh, the economic fallout of a pandemic or policy responses to the pandemic? Exactly zero. That's kind of a shocking result. I was surprised initially. Um, we went back and reread all the articles about the um, 1918, 1990, 19 Spanish, so-called Spanish flu in the United States, just to make sure we somehow hadn't messed this up. Um, there were, as, as some of you will know, there were other major sizable pandemics in uh, 57, 58 and 1967, if I remember right. Those get no mention either. So. There's something about the, the coronavirus and the e economy in which it happened and the policy responses to it that led to a dramatically different, uh, different outcome. So if I look at the period from 24 February to 30 April, that's, that's when the market was most volatile in reaction to COVID related news and policy responses to COVID. There were 27 jumps in this period, which is an extraordinary number, by the way. Um, 25 of those, 24 to 25 of those were attributed in next day newspaper accounts to, um, to the pandemic or the policy response to the pandemic. And we've done a similar thing for China back to 1990. Of course, China didn't have much of a market to speak of before the mid eighties. You, you don't have as many along as a time period, but it's the same basic story. Um, this is for the Shanghai Stock Exchange, but same basic story for the Hong Seng, the Hong Kong exchange. So, so that's that's one way to get a handle. Um, in fact, we've written a whole paper, which is titled something like the unprecedented stock market impact of the coronavirus, which is trying to, I think, to speak to um, what the, uh, uh, speak to the question by looking first at the stock market reaction, but then filling it out with other, with, with um, other information about the pandemic. So, this does this methodology does give us a an opportunity to say something like, well, is yeah, we know the coronavirus was a big deal, but from a financial market perspective, what's even more unusual about the coronavirus isn't the scale of the virus, but the unprecedented stock market reaction to it relative to the health severity of the of the virus. That's an even more dramatic. Um, Impact. So we make we develop this point more fully in a number of ways in this in this other paper that draws on this one. I hope I answered the question that the, the speaker had in mind, or at least got close to it. If not, you know, follow up again. Yeah, that that was great. I, I certainly learned a lot from the response. Um, so we have a, a couple of questions from Cheng Yu. So I'm gonna I'm gonna concatenate them into one question. So the the first question is. Does the increasing clarity over policy moves suggest a learning effect in both the market and policymakers? And then the follow-up is, if it is the case, does it suggest policymakers are losing uh, their independence? That means they're issuing policy moves somewhat in, in expectation of the market. Yeah, um, so let me take those one at a time. Um, you know, there's been a conscious effort by 
by central bankers in the United States and in much of the world not, uh, to, to try to be more transparent um, about what they're doing and why. Um, and so that may be, that may be part of what's, what's going on um, with the increased clarity. Um, but we do an exercise in the paper, which I didn't put on my slide deck. It's basically a between within uh, category comparison. And, and I'll just give you the bottom line. It's a standard you know, kind of shift share type decomposition. So nothing very sophisticated. But what we find is that uh, about two thirds of the long-term increase in clarity is coming from a shift in the mix of, uh, shift in the mix of um, categories. And the other one third is kind of coming from within categories. So, so it's, some of, it's some of both, um, but, uh, and we haven't looked, maybe we should do this in a more systematic way. It's kind of, it's a good idea suggested by the question kind of look more specifically at the uh, at what's happened to the clarity surrounding jumps driven by monetary policy over time. Now, the sample is going to be fairly thin because it's only going to be about, you know, 110 or 120 such jumps, but, but we could do something there. Um, <clears throat> so what does it mean for independence? I, you know, I, it's hard. I'm, I'm not sure how to answer that question, the independence of policymakers, because it's a little surprising just the fact that there seems to be a capacity, which has increased over time, of policymakers to engineer upward jumps. Because stock market jumps to a first order are, are surprises. Okay, so it's not, you know, it, it may be that the policymakers are, are, are content to occasionally engineer a positive upward jump, and it's offset by lots of small or negative jumps. If I think about it in a risk neutral world uh, with risk neutral pricing, I suspect that's, that might be something to that. I suspect that's not the whole story, that somehow there's something about the way that um, risk premium, stochastic discount factors are reacting to policy news uh, that is at play there. But I, I don't have a deeper explanation uh, at this point. I think it's one of the puzzles, maybe the, maybe from a conceptual or theoretical point, the biggest single puzzle put forth by this paper is how is it possible for policymakers to systematically, not, not, not without fail, but on average, to generate upward, upward policy driven stock market moves in the wake of bad economic performance, which is what we find. And the results are quite strong. But of course, if it's bad economic performance, everybody can see it's bad economic performance. So you're sort of expecting something to happen from the policymakers. Um, and yet, nonetheless, on average, we're getting what look like positive surprises out of the policymaking um, uh, process. So here, I'm, I don't have a deep explanation for that. I think uh, it kind of begs for one. Um, and I hope that this 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 result will encourage people to think about that. It certainly speaks well of policymakers <laughs> if, yeah, that they're able to execute on this and that they've become increasingly able to execute on it. I'm going to jump in with one of my own questions to sort of build on on that and sort of ask you to speculate a bit beyond your data. And so one thing that that the project I, I think raises a question to me is if journalists have been willing to speak with more clarity about events generally. So I think a lot about elections and election outcomes. I'm curious if over time you would think that there is uh, increasing clarity on what drove a particular election outcome, why it is, you mentioned sports journalism, why it is particular team wins, if, if this is a sort of news effect, a sort of professionalization of journalists, or if there is something specific about what policymakers are doing to drive the stock market to induce this, this clarity. Yeah, not another great question. I'm, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. So a, a few things. You know, as we discuss in the paper, there's external information that suggests very strongly a few things. First, that the scope, quality, and timeliness of economic statistics about uh, statistics about economic performance have improved dramatically over time. So again, let me, 
I'll, I'll, I'll make this argument in terms of the BLS employment situation report, just because that's probably the, the macroeconomic statistic that is um, likely to be familiar to many of you. And it's also historically been one of the most important for moving markets. That, that source originated in the 20s or 30s. And it started out as a, con as a convenient sample of manufacturing plants and firms. That really wasn't a very good sample. We, by modern standards, we think it's a pretty bad sample. It's grown over time um, in terms of um, the quality of the sampling design, the size of the sample, the coverage of the economy. And that, that and there's a, I'm leaving out a bunch of details. That, that process has continued um, and the other thing that's important is the timeliness of the release. Okay, we're now accustomed to getting the BLS employment situation report, you know, um, a week or so uh, after the month that, that, it's co that it's covering. Well, that's, that's pretty timely when you're trying to cover essentially the whole private sector. Um, so there's been big improvements over decades. That, and that's on the public sector side. More recently, and we saw this in a big way in, in the COVID crisis, we've had increasing availability of private information sources, Google mobility indexes, for example. That's a fairly recent development. The thing, uh, the thing I'm trying to convey to you is the overall quality of statistics about the macroeconomic environment and the timeliness of them has improved tremendously. So that's one thing that's going on. That's apart from policy itself. You know, my, my earlier I said that the monetary authority is now much more conscious and makes an effort to try to be transparent and clear. The other, another big thing that in this regard is, is think about the role of the Securities and Exchange Commission, which was born, born in the 1930s and is basically the entity that is, defines the disclosure requirements for publicly listed corporations. Those disclosure requirements have gotten um, you know, more and more demanding over time. And so on the corporate earnings side and all the supplemental information, you know, not just the 10Ks that are filed annually, the quarterly 10Qs and all the information releases, the information coming out of those things has also gotten better, more timely, more easily accessible. Now you can just get them online quite, quite quickly and easily. So, I, and so we, we talk about this more in the paper, but I think there's no doubt in my mind that there's been a long-term increase, uh, deepening improvement in the timeliness, quality, and scale and scope of data, okay, for all these reasons I just talked about. I think that's probably the single biggest reason clarity has increased. Now, on top of that, let me get to your point about the professionalization of journalists. There's, there's something there as well. I base this mainly on just having read lots of these things. You can see, you can see that, um, it, in my experience, the first newspaper to have what seemed like professionalized reporting style on a consistent basis for the stock market was the Wall Street Journal, and maybe the New York Times was second, and and then over time, you know, the big regional news, some of the big regional newspapers like the L.A. Times, Chicago Tribune, they they may have gone backwards in more recent years. So I, I don't quite know how to quantify this in a precise way, um, but we do see evidence of increased professionalization of the journalist core as well. One more point along those lines and then a, about an empirical observation and then an economic observation, which I think makes helps to understand why this has happened. When you look across countries, you typically find something that in hindsight is not very surprising. Countries that are less developed, that have less deep equity markets, typically have lower quality economic reporting in the newspapers. That makes perfect sense when you think about it. The United States market is huge. There are people who trade in the US market around the world. There's intense demand for high quality information about the US market. That demand is greater than it was decades past. So just a market scale effect would lead you to expect um, both more information dug up, but better quality reporting as a consequence. The evidence I see says that's happened over time. It's also true in the cross-section across countries. 
Excellent. Okay, so I think we can do maybe one more question that'll be recorded, and then there's a couple of questions in the chat that I think are going to be more nuts and bolts, and so I'm going to defer those. So the, the last question I'm going to ask you builds on the discussion we were just having. It's from, from Dave Rosker, and he asks, is there a bias in financial journalism to be willing to credit good news to policy movements, but more hesitant to cast blame on bad news? You know, sort of victory has a thousand fathers, and uh, uh, defeats an orphan kind of idea. Could be. Um, can't rule that out completely. I mean, there's a whole bunch. All we can say is there's a whole bunch of validation exercises in the paper that that make a pretty compelling case that there's substantial signal content in the classifications. But that doesn't mean that there there's no scope for bias of the sort that you mentioned. I think the perhaps the best piece of evidence against that that we have, and it's some of this proof of pudding stuff, is that jumps that get classified as monetary policy have a lot of predictive power for future stock market volatility, conditional on kind of standard controls for stock market volatility. Again, that doesn't rule out any role for bias, but it does suggest that if bias is present, it's not, it's not large enough to kind of negate that predictive content of jumps being classified as monetary policy. Excellent. The, no. one, you know, the other thing to mention in that regard is, again, if that's the story of what's going on, it would have to be kind of across all the countries in our sample. So because we, we see this, we see this pattern um, in all 16 countries, it suggests it's, it, it's not just because newspaper reporters in the United States like Democrats and they don't like Republicans or something like that. It's got to be it's got to be something more pervasive. Okay, excellent. So what we're going to go ahead and do is we're going to pause the recording now. We'll take a break. We'll thank Steve for a, a fantastic presentation. And then for everyone who wants to stick around, we're going to open the discussion up a bit more. We'll, we'll let people ask their own questions. And I think we can dive into some of these really compelling nuts and bolts questions that Steve was referencing. So Steve, thank you very much. Thank and you. we'll reconvene here in about one minute.